you, but every time we make time to show up, God moves and he helps us, he encourages us, he builds us up in the faith. And so super excited to be here. And I know this is kind of like the last run for any type of vacations. And so um, I know some are out today and I want to encourage you. Uh, like I did almost every week, if you have not gone on vacation, hey, go on vacation. <laughs> it is healthy for you to go on vacation with your family and connect and to get refreshed. And it's always a great time to go to church, but I, I believe that, you know, we need to take care of our families and, and, and be together. So well, my name is Levi, Pastor here at High Ridge, and super excited to be here. I also want to welcome all the first-time guests, if you're a first-time guest. Come on, fam, let's give them a great, warm welcome. So glad you're here. I also want to welcome all of you who are watching online. So a uh, few announcements before we start today. Uh, the first one is that we have what we call Growth Track. And so it is like a membership class, but it's in two parts. And part one, you're going to learn all about High Ridge and what we're about and our statement of faith and kind of what we believe in and, and our our core values, our mission, our vision, kind of where we, we're going as a church. And we're about a little over a year and a half in as a, a newer church plant. And so God has definitely moved in a mighty way. Obviously, we're hitting over 200 salvations so far since we've launched and seen so many people baptized. And that's what it's all about. Come on, somebody. That's what it's all about is God showing up and moving in the lives of those around us. And so and in part two is where you take a spiritual gifts test and you learn um, what your gifts are and how you can get involved and get connected into High Ridge Church. And so you can use the gifts God has given you so we can make a difference in our community. Our mission here is that we exist to invite people on a journey where they can know God, find freedom, discover their purpose, and what? Make a difference. All right, this is why we're here. Uh, we are here to truly make a difference. So second announcement, I want to invite Austin Howard to come on up. Guys, give it up for Austin Howard. So Austin oversees the outreach ministry here at Howard Ridge. So if you want to get involved and get into the community and get connected, he is your guy, and he wants to share with you something upcoming for us. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Awesome. All right, so as Pastor Levi said, my name's Austin Howard. I oversee outreach. And um, yeah, so make a difference. Outreach is all about making a difference. So it's our opportunity to get out of these four walls and go and serve our community. And so I just wanted to bring some opportunities to you today about outreach. And the first one here is, is our back to school supply. So anybody have kids going back to school? Lots of people. I can barely see you guys. Um, yeah, so we're, we, every year, like to adopt a local school and uh, give some supplies, maybe some appreciation to the teachers. And so this year, we actually have three schools. So we're doing uh, First Street, Creekside Oaks, and Charlie C. Coppin Elementary. They're all in Lincoln, and they're all Title I schools. And uh, they have a combined 65 teachers and 1,400 low-income students. So we're coming alongside those schools and we're trying to get some supplies and uh, get, get some teacher appreciation so that way we can show them the love of Jesus Christ. So if you guys are interested in helping us with this back to school drive, we got lots of different ways that you can do that. But if you are interested, we have a table outside after service today if you wanna come talk to me or, or grab one of these flyers. Um, it's got a list of school supplies. And um, you know, if you can, purchase supplies, we'd love for you to buy them and bring them here on August 13th, uh, next Sunday. Can everybody say Sunday, August 13th? Awesome. You guys are amazing. So August 13th, we, uh, you bring your supplies here and we'll um, pack them up in the backpacks and, and disperse them out to these three schools. And um, if you can't do supplies, um, you're welcome to give financially a monetary uh, donation and you can do that on High Ridge Church's website. Um, it's going to be highridgechurchca.com forward slash give. And you got to select missions and outreach. And that makes sure that your money goes towards the outreach ministry and helping um, in these things. So um, if you're unable to provide monetary and supplies, we just ask that you pray for these schools. Uh, just make sure that we are praying that they have an awesome, safe school year. And um, yeah, so... If you guys are open to that and you guys want to help out, um, we got lots of opportunities. So I want to kind of shift gears and share a win from outreach. So yesterday, um, we were able to uh, deliver 20 large clothing bags 
to our local community score. So that's amazing. <laughs> and so the, the community store is one of those outreach opportunities we have here at High Ridge. And um, the, it's a basically a free store for homeless or low income. Anybody who is in need of clothing, they can go and grab clothes and walk out. It's all free. Um, and it's one of the opportunities we have. But if you're interested in serving in outreach, uh, you can go to the High Ridge Groups um, page and find outreach groups. And from there, you'll see blessing bags, you'll see um, the community store, and you'll see the food pantry. Those are three groups that we have for outreach. Um, and always, you can, you can find me in the lobby, find me out front, and, and ask me any questions you have. So yeah, let's um, you know come together and support our next generation of leaders in these schools. And um, yeah, let's go make a difference. Amen. Thank you. All right, you guys ready to get into God's word? Ready? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. We, we thank you, Lord, that uh, you have a word for us today. And I pray, Lord, that you speak to us um, as we get closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, super excited about today because um, we start our 21-day prayer and fasting. Now, for you to know, some of us, is that we, the church was started with prayer. We started an actual prayer Zoom call. This was uh, during the whole pandemic time. We really couldn't meet, and so we'd have Zoom calls, and we'd pray, and we'd ask the Lord what that would look like. And uh, we were actually um, in, in Texas at this time, and we were f starting to get launch team members, and things were growing, and God was moving. But we always knew that if we pray, God would move every single time, is that the church is not found, founded on me or my abilities, or how good I am, or, or anyone else, but this is God's church, and we've said this from day one. This is His church. We're just coming along part of what God is doing to make a difference. That's what we're called to do, and so we started praying and believing. So we're in 21-day prayer fasting. What we're doing is we're taking time away to pray and seek the Lord, and we're also fasting, and maybe for some of us, that's a, a Daniel's fast, or maybe it's it's for me, it's definitely going to be sweets because I have a big sweet tooth. Um, maybe it's social media. Just turning that bad boy off. Somebody say off. Just turn it off for 21 days. Can you do it? Can you survive? I don't know. But just try it. But we're saying something that's very important. So we're going to take it to it. We're going to put it aside and seek the Lord, not only for what God's going to do here at High Ridge, but what God's going to do in your family in you and your life, because I know that there's something great that he wants to do in you and through you, and that's through prayer and fasting. So today, I want to just, I want to talk about prayer. I want to talk about what that looks like. And so we do this twice a year, in January and in August. We're going to do a 21-day prayer fast, and we're going to seek the Lord's face, and we're going to ask God, help us, speak to us, give us a word. So today we're going to talk about prayer, and prayer is when we talk to God. Prayer is when we connect to God. And fasting is when we disconnect from the world. How many of us can definitely use some disconnection right now? <laughs> and disconnect ourselves from the world's thinking and mind and all the craziness that's going on in our society and in our world and um, on our jobs and our neighborhoods, wherever that is, and all the turmoil. Just, just disconnect from that and just open up our Bible a little bit more. And just get on our knees a little bit more than that before. Prayer is a big one because for me, I got saved when I was 16 years old. But I'll tell you what, it was hard for me to pray. Even when I got saved because I was traumatized when I was in high school. I was a freshman. And in our high school, they had a big, um, a big area right in the middle. And all the Christians would come together and they would pray together. They would make this big prayer circle. You ever seen that before? on a high school campus. And so they would walk, and what they would do is a big old prayer circle, and I would walk by. Remember, I was not saved. It was, you know, at lunchtime. It was breakfast or, or in the morning and at lunch. And then they would have this circle, and I would walk by, and they would just be hold hands and be rocking back and forth, and they would start screaming and yelling and sweating, and, and they would say things. And there was a guy named Brother James. I'll never forget Brother James because Brother James was a man of prayer. But here's the deal. He would pray things like this. Oh, Lord, I pray for all the heathens up in this school. Lord, I pray that you bring down fire and burn them up, Lord. Come on now. I said burn them up, Lord. I'm like, who are you burning up? You ain't burning me up. Like, I, don't, I don't think that's what he's supposed to do. And I'm not going to pray. <laughs> because, 
And man, they would throw stuff and they would get in the middle of this quad and they would lay hands and they would fall out and they would just, you know, all this screaming and yelling. I'm like, man, I am not going to pray. So when I got 16, I went to a youth service and gave my life to Jesus. I, I would see this and then we would go in circles and, you know, everybody would take turns praying and they would squeeze your hand. And every time I squeeze the next hand, I'm like, nah, bro, I ain't doing that. I'm not doing the screaming and yelling and, and, and back flipping and, and rolling and stuff like that. I'm not doing that. But I'll never forget about a year in to give my life to Jesus. One day I just said a short prayer. Lord, thank you for this day. And it was such a faith-filled prayer. And it was such a prayer that, that I just had to stand up and just do something. I had to pray. And when I learned that praying was not about everyone else listening to me, but praying was simply me talking to God, it changed my life forever. I don't have to pray loud. I don't have to talk to God loud. I don't have to scream at God. I can just be myself and just talk to God. I can talk to God when I'm driving in the car. I can talk to God when I'm at home. I'm in my quiet time. If I'm, I'm cooking or, or, you know, smoking meat. Can we got anybody? I would say we got any smokers in the house, but y'all would take that wrong. So we got anybody that like to smoke meat. I bought me a nice little, it's called a pit boss. And boy, I've been just messing up meat like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> hey, but I've been trying. All right? I'm trying to get there. Um, but I tell you what, so but I'm out there just burning stuff and just praising the Lord and praying with them, you know, and asking God for wisdom on how to make my brisket. Oh, Lord, give me a Texas brisket in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord. But praying is something that God wants us to do. So let's get into his word. All right, let's, let's go. We're going to talk about prayer today. And I want to share with you four ways to develop a lifestyle of prayer. And for many of us, you, maybe you have not even started to truly pray yet. Maybe this is a little awkward. Maybe we don't want to pray out loud yet because, you know, we're, we're kind of embarrassed. We're not, we don't really know how to pray. Or, and by the way, you do know how to pray. You just talk to God like you talk to everyone. You just talk to God. You just talk to him. It doesn't have to be this fancy way of speaking. You just simply talk to him. Or maybe you have been a person of prayer, but because of trials and circumstances in your life, you find yourself that you have not really had a prayer life anymore. We stop talking to God and we're talking to everyone else. When we want to get to a place in our life where we truly talk to God. When I think about prayer, I think about Daniel. And we're going to read Daniel chapter 6 today, starting in verse 1. A little history on Daniel. He is a major prophet. Now, in the Bible, you know that it's not written in chronological order, but it's, it's in different groups. And you have the minor prophets and major prophets. And because Daniel's a major prophet, it doesn't mean that he's more important than the other prophets. It just means that the book is longer. That's all it means. <laughs> and minor prophets, is, it's a shorter book. He's a major prophet. It took place in Babylon. Uh, but at this point in Daniel chapter 6, they were no longer under Babylonian rule, but Persian rule. Daniel, his name means God my judge, and he's about in his 80s right now. Um, I actually heard a, someone came up to me right before service, and uh, he actually was on, on the launch team before we launched, and he said, could he just help out? His daughter knows my daughter, and they came to an interest party, and he was not saved yet. And he said, yes, yeah. man, you can help out. So he would help load the truck or help unload things before we launched. And on launch day, he gave his life to Jesus. I like, just, just raised his hand and gave his life to Jesus. And then he told me today, he says, hey, um, it took about a year for you to tell me to, to actually read the Bible, and I've, I actually opened up the Bible, and I started reading, and I started reading Daniel. And I said, well, we're going to talk about Daniel today. Come on. <laughs> so that's confirmation for you to keep reading your Bible. So, but it's just amazing what God does. Daniel chapter 6, starting verse 1. Let's go ahead and read through it. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces. That's 12 leaders. And he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Okay, so now you got this guy, Daniel, gets favor from the Lord. Verse 4, then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. And I want you to pay attention to this. He says, he was faithful, 
always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded, only our chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. And I want to just share this with you, and this really jumped out at me, is let us be like Daniel. That, that we are, when people see us, we are faithful, we're always responsible, and we're completely trustworthy. And that the only accusation or only thing that someone could bring against us as Christians is that we're Christians. And you know what? That's a compliment. If you're mad at me because I'm a Christian, I've done nothing wrong. I am living for the Lord. So we don't fight in a way of bad-mouthing people or putting people down or talking bad about other religions or other people or leaders. We don't do that. Instead, we honor people and we keep ourselves faithful, responsible, and trustworthy. Amen? All right. Verse 6. So the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, Long live King Darius. We are all in agreement, we administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. So now they find what they can accuse him of is because he was a man of prayer. And they said, I can't get him on anything else. He has great character. He's a great man of God. But you know what? He's always praying. So let's get the king to then find, sign a decree to say, let's get this guy and let's take him out because he's a man of prayer. Verse 8, and now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual. Look at that, as usual. In his upstairs room, he had a place. So he did it all the time. He had a place with its window open toward Jerusalem so that everybody can see that he was a man of prayer. That the world says you can't pray, but he says, you know what? I'm not going to talk bad about them. I'm not going to make a big deal about it. But you know what? I'm going to pray. I'm going to open up my window, and I'm going to pray to my God because he's my God. The king's not my God. He's my God. What they say is not my God. He is my true God. And he began to pray. See, Daniel understood this truth. Kneeling to pray is what gives you the strength to stand. You need strength in your life? We need to kneel. We need to pray. He knew that, man, I'm being accused of this. And he had two different situations he could see himself in. He could say, well, you know what? Praying is more of a private relationship with God. I don't need the world, I don't need the world to know that, I'm, I'm, that I pray to, God, to my God. I'll just keep it quiet, keep those doors closed, keep that window closed, and I'm just going to keep praying to my God. Or I'm not going to be intimidated by that. I'm going to open up those windows, and I'm going to let them know how good our God is, even if it means me being thrown in a lion's den. He knew what he was facing, but he still chose to honor God and to pray. First way to make prayer a lifestyle, number one, is to make prayer a priority. I like to say it this way. We must pray first. Look, every time we get up in the morning, we pray first. Every time you get a bad report, what we're going to do? We're going to pray first. Every time we get in an argument or we have a bad thought or, there's, there's, or someone does us wrong or, or unforgiveness starts to come into our hearts, we're going to pray first. Why? Because when we pray to God, he'll give you wisdom and direction and guidance and tell you what to do next. Not only that, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will speak through you. So when you are in those hard conversations, if you have prayed first and you've talked to God, when you talk to that person, he will speak through you. He will give you the words to speak. There is confidence when you pray first. There is confidence when you talk to God instead of talking to people. And I think that it's easier for us sometimes to talk to people because we can see that person talking to us. And we're seeking validation from man instead of God. But true faith is when you believe and speak to God who you can't see, but you know he's there. That's how your faith is stretched, that it's actually more valuable and it's actually a lot better to 
pray for two minutes to God that you can't see. If we're struggling with that, though, we really can see through creation. You can see them. But then to go to talk to 50 people and tell them what's going on, and everybody has different opinions, and now you are messed up and confused as all get out. Come on. You've been like that before? Well, I'm going to go tell everybody what's going on with me, and you talk to them, and the person you thought that would be on your side is totally against you. And you're like, well, why? Well, that person didn't read their Bible that morning. And they just told you what they felt about you. Or there was an offense they had about you from last year. And this was their chance to let you know what's up. And so we have to make sure that we pray first. Somebody say pray first. We're going to pray first. Look at the bottom of verse 10. It says he prayed three times a day. Man. I mean, this was something he did all the time. Just as he had always done. So he was praying way before the persecution even came. It was a lifestyle to Daniel. It says giving thanks to his God. Number two, we must make prayer a habit. It's a habit. It's a habit. How you start a habit, you just start. <laughs> and you do it consistently. If you're like me, my calendar, I, I live by my calendar <laughs> because there's so many things going on. And I have to make sure that it's in my calendar, right? And it's a routine. It's a habit. It's what we do. If it's important to you, you'll do it. And you do it 21 times. Matter of fact, 21 day of prayer, I challenge you to pray every day for the next 21 days. And I guarantee it'll be a habit. And you'll be able to launch into a better prayer life than you've ever had before. But you have to start. See, prayer is never a last line of defense. It's our first line of offense. What will happen when a church prays? What would happen is when we hear bad news about anything in our state, our society, or in our world, we stop and together we pray. When two or more gather in his name, the Bible says, whatever you ask in prayer, believe and you shall what? Receive. It's when, the, it's when we say that we trust our God so much that no matter what comes against us as a church, we will pray. Well, I'm going to tell everybody how it is, and I'm going to get on social media. I don't know why I'm talking country. I have no idea. I'm going to get on social media, and I'm going to tell them my thought, and I'm going to sit down and eat some ice cream. Well, you did nothing but make yourself feel good. But it didn't really make a difference. But when the church comes together and we pray, walls will fall down. People who are broken and who need Jesus, they will come. Right? Because of your prayers. God moves when we prayers. To make prayer a habit, you must have a plan. So I'm going to give you a plan that I love to do. It's found in Luke chapter 11. Jesus is talking to his disciples. And this is more of a, you would, you've heard it called the Lord's Prayer. And I'll call this a template. It's a template for prayer. And I use this all the time, okay? It's actually very, very powerful. I have a prayer book that I have, and I write, I write this in there, and I put comments in here. So let, let's go through it. Luke chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. It says, Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Okay? So he's, they're talking back and forth. They're connecting with each other. Lord, teach me to pray. And I wrote this point is to connect with God relationally. Okay, so we're going to go through this prayer, and I'm going to give you some points, okay? Connect with God relationally. Listen, we are in a relationship with God. It's not about legalism. It's not about do's and don'ts. It's not about I'm saved, so now I can't smoke, can't drink, can't this, can't that, can't this. God says, put that down and come to me. And if you're not supposed to do it, I will convict your heart, and then you will ch truly change. Right? So, it's, so let's get away from what we can't do, and let's talk about what we can do and have a relationship with God, a true, authentic. Remember when you first gave your life to Jesus, how excited you were and fired up for God? You can have that today. It's by truly having an authentic relationship with God. Verse 2, so he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Here's the point. Worship his name. There are so many names of God in the Bible. Study the names of God and start to find out who he is. Okay? And God, I worship your name. I don't worship my boss's name. I don't worship the pastor's name. 
I don't worship my spouse's name. I don't worship my kids' names. Okay, it's quiet. Sorry, guys. But I worship who? I worship his name. I worship his name. You just start calling out the names of God. And, you know, he is my Lord. He is my provider. Come on. God, you're going to provide for me. And you begin to call that out and believe in that. Let's keep going. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here's the point. Pray his agenda first. Not our agenda. Let's not pray about our agenda and our wants and what we want to see happen. We pray his agenda. God, what do you want? God, what is your will for my life? God, who do you want me to minister to today? God, who should I pray for right now as I'm praying? That I'm not praying about me. I'm praying about others because I want to be used by you. Let's keep going. Verse 3 says, give us day by day our daily bread. Depend on him for everything. I get to a place where, God, I depend on you for everything. If I don't have a job, I depend on you. Everything that I have is not mine. God, it's all yours. I depend on you. Verse 4, it says, And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Here's the point. Get your heart right with God and people. So many of us are in a tornado, spinning around the circles over and over and over. When our thoughts, and it's leading to depression and anxiety, we need to get our hearts right with God. How do you do that? You pray to him, you ask for forgiveness, and you come to him like he's God. You don't come to him with shame. God doesn't put shame on you. He's not a, a God that we fear in a way that we're going to get hurt, but we have fear, which means that we reverence him. We have reverence for him. We honor his holy name. And we get right with people. Let's drop our pride. Let's make the phone call. I'll probably say this every other message probably. <laughs> Because it's so important. Let's have the phone call. Let's have the coffee. Let's connect with people. And when you have this as your template, I tell you what, it will change. Your prayer should not always point back to you. It should always point to him. And he'll speak to you on how to be a minister to preach and to teach and to pray for others. If your prayers are always selfish prayers, then life is all about you. And when you don't get what you want because the prayer is all about you, then you'll start to think that he's not a faithful God. But remember, he's already done enough by giving his son Jesus to die on a cross for our sins. He's already done enough. Let's keep going. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I like to say it this way. Engage in spiritual warfare. We are in a battle, my friend. And we're not on defense. We're on offense. We don't go around blaming the devil for everything that goes on. We pray. We believe. We fast, we walk in the authority of Christ, and we move closer to Jesus. When you pray, you'll see more of God instead of seeing yourself. When you pray, you'll see more of God than the, than the people around you and in your issue or your problems. The reason why all we see sometimes are all the problems is because we're worshiping our problems instead of truly worshiping God. And if you look back at the situation you're in today, you can ask yourself, how much time have I put into truly worshiping and praying to God? All right, here's another one. If you don't know what to pray, so, th so that's one. That's a great model. Now, the next one is, if you don't know what to pray, I always say this. Just pray scripture. Just pray scripture. Here's a good one. Psalm chapter 16, verse 1 through 2. Here it is. Keep me safe, my God, for you for in you, I take refuge. You can stop and pray. Lord, thank you for keeping me safe. Thank you for keeping my family safe. Thank you for keeping those around me safe. I thank you, Lord. Uh, for in you, I have refuge. Verse 2, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. God, you are my Lord. You're everything that I ever need. You sit on the throne of my heart. Not people or things, but you sit on the throne of my heart. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Without you, nothing is good. Because you're the only one that's actually good. And I need you in my life to have a good thing. All right. So that's how it looks. So those are a couple of models you can have, having a plan, helping you um, just make prayer a habit in your life. Let's keep going. Daniel prays with his window open to Jerusalem. Let's go back in Daniel chapter 6, and we're going to start with verse 11. I, I want to read this to you because I want you to get the context, and I want you to see the story, okay? 
Verse 11, then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So now they, they see Daniel. They catch him. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you? It's amazing how they made this rule to worship the king instead of worshiping God. He goes, your majesty will be thrown into the den of lions. And then the king says, yes, the king replied, that decision stands. It is an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. Then they told the king, that man, Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. So now he's caught. The king knows. And I'm going to ask you this question. What would stop you from being a follower of Christ? What would stop you? Would this be it? If they came to you and said, hey, I saw you praying and the windows were open. Is that true, Daniel? Would you say, yeah, that was me. I was praying. Or would we say, no, that wasn't me. What would stop you from truly being a follower of Christ? And I'm here to tell you, we're getting to that day. There could be a day where we are faced with someone asking you, are you a Christian? And if you are a Christian, you will lose your life. And this is why if you pray to God and believe in God and grow stronger with God and have a relationship with God, you'll realize that we're just passing through. That if I'm persecuted, if I'm taken out for the gospel's sake, I'm not going to be so caught up in trying to save this life. I'm going into the true life, and that's with Jesus Christ. So let us not ever think that this is true life. We are here on mission to do the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, Go out, therefore, make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are here to move, to help people, to make a difference around us, not to just be comfortable in our nice home with our nice boat. He wants us to be blessed, too. He wants us to be on the boat and have fun and have things. That's okay. But that's not, this is not what true life is. So if you were Daniel... What would you do? Verse 14. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your majesty, you know that according to the law of Medes and Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, may your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. So now the king is praying for, for Daniel. Now he has favor with the king. By the way, prayer gives you favor with God, right? Because you have a relationship with him. Verse 17, a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. So now he's in this den with lions. Have you ever watched those on Instagram reels, them lions? Y'all seen that? Like, I'm out, dude. Like, I can't do the whole lion thing. Well, I can't even do a bug, but anyways. But, but a lion, right? Like, I've seen it. I've seen them just go up and just take something down. And they, they're in packs and they're on the wing and they come out and take you down. And this is what he's faced with. He's in this den, and then the stone is now rolled over. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. Number three, prayer helps you overcome anxiety. And I feel like there's some of us today, this is where we are. We're at a place, we feel like our back's against the wall, and we have no hope. We don't know what's going on. And I, and I want to tell you this. You actually do have hope. Because, see, Daniel was praying way before the lion's den. He didn't, like, do his own thing and live his own life. And when he got in the lion's den, he said, okay, now I'm praying, God, get away from these lions. And they, and they take him by his neck and take him down. No, he was like, hey, this is what God's will for me right now. That's what God's will. There's a better place. And that's what I want to challenge us with today is are we praying even before anxiety? And I believe that one of the things that will stop us from praying and we find ourselves with anxiety are very simple is that there's too much uh, social pressure, right? Here's another one. We have believed that we can have it all. We think we can just have it all. So then we go off and we get ourselves so busy that we don't even have time to really connect with God. 
We have believed that we can do it all. Anybody like that today where you've gotten so burnt out because you think you can do it all? You cannot do it all, right? It's it's okay to delegate. Here's another one is we have too many choices. We have too many choices. Here's a principle I want you to get today. It is better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of what does. More of what does. Because there's a lot more going on. Here are a few fun stats for you I want to share with you about busyness and about our life. One of them is that we're going to eat out 14,411 times, including 1,811 trips to McDonald's. Any McDonald people here today? Oh, yeah, y'all. Y'all so holy now. I'm sorry. You know, you know you're going to hit that McChicken later. Anyways, we're going to spend 13 years and four months watching TV, television. We're going to spend five years waiting in lines. Oh, Disneyland, Jesus, I will not in the name. One year looking for misplaced items, keys. Okay, I'm going to throw that out there in case you're saying that's not me. Yes, it is. You're going to drive 627,000 miles. That's 25 times around the world. We got to get to a place in our life, guys, where we are taking time with the Lord so they will decrease and take the anxiety away from our life. We got to get our life scheduled. Amen. Daniel chapter 6, verse 18. It says, Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep at all that night. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got out there, when he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? Look at his response. Daniel answered, long live the king. Not long live me. I made it. I can't believe it. Long live the king. Right? He's, he's giving him honor and respect. But already he's not focusing on the fact that he made it out. Why? Because he was already praying before. He knew that if God wanted him to be rescued, he would be rescued. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. Let's go all the way down to verse 27. King's excited about this, about God showing up. He says he rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. I want you to know God will rescue you as well, too. It starts with a life of prayer. It starts with having a hunger for God, a true hunger for him that cannot go away. Verse 28, so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Number four, when you make prayer lifestyle, miracles can happen through prayer. See, we serve a supernatural God. Do you understand that? We're just natural. When you connect to God, he's supernatural. We have a supernatural God who loves us, and miracles will happen. Some people say, well, miracles are not for today. Oh, yes, it is. I need a miracle. Anybody else need a miracle? I need some miracles. And yes, they are. And some people will say, well, I messed up so much that God's not going to give me a miracle. Yes, he will. We have to have faith. Miracles do happen. As a Christian, here's our mindset. If you live, you are delivered. If you die, you are delivered. You're going to go to heaven. You are delivered. You are delivered. I'm going to end with this, with this story today. I was really praying through this and thinking about prayer. I know we read a lot of scripture. By the way, I will never apologize for reading a lot of scripture. Because this is why we're here, to read scripture. Amen. The word of God is what changes our life. And I was thinking about prayer and when prayer was a big deal for me. So I told you guys when I was 16... I got saved, and about a year later, I started praying, and I learned how to pray. Well, so um, this, that all happened later in my life. But when I was 10 years old, my family, we moved from, uh, from Texas, and we moved to Fairfield. And I lived from Fairfield from 10 to, to I think, 23, until I went to Bible College in Dallas. And, in that, and I was 10 years old. We just moved. Now, I had um, a a cousin that had two young daughters. I think they were about five and seven. And I was very close to them. I would see them all the time and uh, very, very close to them. So it was very hard when I left here because I was so close to them. I would see them all the time. And my cousin, she was married. 
And something happened where she went through a hard time and they, she wound up getting divorced. They wound up going through this bad divorce. And I remember talking to her on the phone, and I was only, yeah, I, thought that, I think I was 11 years old at that time, and, and she was telling me about it, and I couldn't believe that she had gone through this divorce. And, and, you know, obviously I'm not an actual Christian yet, and I didn't know much about, you know, Christianity and all that. She w- would go to church sometimes, and so she was going through a lot, and then I would talk to my mom about it, and then we get this call from my, from my aunt, and she says, hey, I want you to know that your uh, cousin is gone. Not only is she gone, but the two daughters are as well. And I said, what? And I remember trying to process that. And what had happened was she was a Christian. She believed in God. She'd go to church. The divorce was so hard for her that with the story, what they told me is that she started focusing more on the situation and the problems and not so much the Lord and not kind of connecting in that way. And I don't know how much of that really, what that really is. But what she did was she thought it was it. She said, you know what? I have no more hope. There's nothing else I can do. So what she did was she went and got them some McDonald's because they love McDonald's. Got them a Happy Meal. Took them into, I know this is kind of hard to hear, but I want you to hear the power of prayer, Okay took her, them into the garage, closed the garage, kept the car on. Now you can imagine what happened with the car on in the garage with the door closed. So my aunt comes out and she sees this and she is just going crazy, which any mom would, right? And something clicked in her from there and turned her back on God, didn't want to live for Jesus anymore, saying God was not real and just went through this whole thing. And I'm trying to process this as an 11-year-old kid, right? Well, Years go by, my aunt went through a deep depression. And she started blaming herself for that. The reason why this happened was because of her. And, and she kept trying to replay everything in her head. And I remember I got, gave my life to Jesus at 16. And, and now I'm, I think I'm going on 17. And I called her. So this is years later. And I said, hey, how's it going? Still, same situation. Dark. Her, her life was dark. She didn't believe in Jesus anymore. I tried to start preaching to her. Hey, let me tell you what happened to me. And I gave my life to Jesus. And I started telling her about how good God is and how mighty the Lord is. And and she listened to me. She goes, you know, I don't want to hear that. I don't want anything to do with God. She goes, why would God allow this to happen to my family? She goes through that. And I remember praying for her and praying for her and praying for her. I kept trying to preach to her and pray for her and preach. And then I remember one day the Lord told me, he says, hey, what you need to do is just pray to me. I got her covered. I'm going to take care of her. And what I did know behind the scenes is she had a coworker who was talking to her about Jesus and talking to her about the gospel. And she winds up giving her life to Jesus. And now she went from deeply depressed to now getting restored and going through counseling. And her whole life was changed. And I believe it all happened. You know why? Because of prayer. Because of prayer. I said, God showed me. He says, hey, even the small prayers, even the, the, those prayers that don't seem so, so big and extravagant. He goes, just the little small prayers of faith. Come on. Pray. This faith of a mustard seed. Just a little bit of prayer. And then sometimes we try to take control of things. But I want you to know, when you pray, God is working. When you pray, he's working in your life. He's working miracles in your life. We have a God who has that miracles happen today, and he wants to see you restored, you delivered, you healed. He wants to see this state delivered, this state healed and restored. And it doesn't, it doesn't come by worrying, trying to figure things out. You know how it happens? Prayer. And I want to stir you up to pray today because there's something that God wants to do in you and through you, and it starts with prayer. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's pray. You're here today. You say, you know what, Pastor? I want to pray today. I want my prayer life to be stirred up. I want to get hungry for God. And I want to to just grow in my prayer. I want to make prayer my lifestyle. And that's you. I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you today. Hands all over this place. Father, we thank you, Lord, for every hand uh, raised today. I pray, Lord, right now that you help us just to have a hunger for you and a hunger for prayer. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in us and in this city and in this community. I pray, Lord, for families as we begin to pray this 21 day of prayer fasting. You're going to give us a now word that we need to grow close to you. In Jesus' name we pray. 
You can put your hands down now. One more prayer before we end today. You're here today. You say, 